You need a mic. So we don't have a quorum, but we're about to start, I assume? We have a Oh, I mean, we have a quorum. Not everybody's here, but we'll go ahead and start. Just before we start the meeting, I just wanted an FYI. So today will be the last meeting I attend as your counsel because we are switching roles a little bit in the office. And I also have code board this every single Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning. So being here from 8.30 and sometimes till 9 or 10 o'clock is a little rough. So uh, the deputy city attorney, uh, Stephanie Throckmorton, will be taking over. She is here to watch part of the meeting today and kind of learn the ropes. But uh, after today's meeting, hopefully I will just see you in the hallways. <laughs> If you're lucky, oh. if you're lucky, if I'm lucky. Hi, hello, everybody. Stephanie Throckmorton. I'm thrilled to join you all today and for the rest of your meetings. I know Gus will be sorely missed. Um, he's done a wonderful job here. I want to thank him for all his hard work and late nights with you all. So starting next month, I will be your counsel, obviously working closely with Mr. Ceballos going forward to make sure we keep giving you guys <laughs> the highest quality representation possible. And um, just thank you to him for all his time working with you all. We hear some great stories. Um, so I'm happy to be here with you all um, from the evenings going forward. And I kid, I'm always here. So any questions, yeah. feel free at any time. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. So thank just a hello and a goodbye. And um, just thank you all very much. Okay. Ready. Recording in progress. All right. Good morning. Welcome to the regularly scheduled. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the City of Coral Gables Historic Preservation Board. We are residents of Coral Gables and are charged for the preservation and protection of historic or architecturally worthy buildings, structures, sites, neighborhoods, and artifacts which impart a distinct historical heritage of the city. The board is comprised of nine members, seven of whom are appointed by the commission, one by the city manager, and the ninth is selected by the board and confirmed by the commission. Five members of the board constitute a quorum and five affirmative votes are necessary for the adoption of any motion. Lobbyist registration disclosure. Any person who acts as a lobbyist pursuant to the city of Coral Gables ordinance number 2006-11 must register with a city clerk prior to engaging in lobbying activities or presentations before city staff, boards, committees, and or the city commission. A copy of the ordinance is available in the office of the city clerk. Failure to register and provide proof of registration shall prohibit your ability to present to the Historic Preservation Board on applications under consideration this afternoon. A lobbyist is defined as an individual, corporation, partnership, or other legal entity employed or retained, whether paid or not, by a principal who seeks to encourage the approval, disapproval, adoption, repeal, passage, defeat, or modifications of any ordinance, resolution, action, or decision of any city commissioner, any action, decision, recommendation of the city manager, any city board or committee, including but not limited to quasi-judicial, advisory board, trust, authority, or council, or any action, decision, or recommendation of city personnel during the time period of the entire decision-making process on the action, decision, or recommendation, which foreseeably will be heard or reviewed by the city commission or a city board or committee, including but not limited to quasi-judicial, advisory board, trust, authority, or council. Presentations made to this board are subject to the city's false claims ordinance, cha chapter 39 of the city of Coral Gables city code. I now officially call the City of Coral Gables Historic Preservation Board meeting of February 15th, 2023 to order. The time is 4.12 p.m. Present are Ms. Donna Spain, Ms. Peggy Rolando, Mr. Michael Maxwell, Mr. Cesar Garcia Pons, Mr. John Fullerton, and myself, Albert Menendez. Uh, approval of the minutes. I'd like to move the minutes of January 18th. Second. Second. We have Mr. Gar Garcia Pons and Mr. Maxwell second. I have a question. I thought we were moving to summary minutes. Is, did I dream that? I mean, I, didn't we have that discussion at one point? Yes. And we are. Um, the reason there was a transcript was because of the Garden of Our Lord application designation, which has since been, the board's decision has been appealed. And so that's why we have a transcript of 
of that particular meeting. Is the city responsible for obtaining the verbatim transcript for uh, someone that's appealing? We recently discussed that, and apparently what we have to do is apparently we are required to have someone here to actually do the, do the transcription, but any we would not get the full the full transcriptions prepared unless there was an appeal, and in which case it would the be the person appealing was responsible for for paying for that. Yes. Okay. We were um, we were actually before we were getting the transcription done, and actually using them instead of minutes. Right. But it was costing the department I know. a lot of no, money. That's why which I was is, surprised to see which this. Is, which is why we cut back to Nancy doing the minutes. But then we were told, no, we must have someone here doing a transcription. So what we'll do is we'll do that, but we won't actually get the transcription right. unless it's required. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. Mr. Maxwell. Yes. 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 Okay. Notice regarding ex parte communications. Please be advised that this board is a quasi judicial board and the items on the agenda are quasi judicial in nature, which requires board members to disclose all ex parte communications. An ex parte communication is defined as any contact communication, conversation, correspondence, memorandum, or other written or verbal communication that takes place outside a public hearing between a member of the public and a member of a quasi-judicial board regarding matters to be heard by the quasi-judicial board. If anyone has made any contact with a board member when the issue comes before the board, the, the member must state on the record the existence of the ex parte communication the party who originated the communication, whether the communication will affect board members' ability to impartially consider the evidence to be presented regarding the matter. Okay, next item on the agenda is deferrals. Mr. Adams. I don't, I don't have anything regarding absences. We have had a request from Bruce Ehrenhaft, and Alicia Bakavi did contact us to say she would try to be here, um, but she didn't know if she was going to make it. She's not been feeling well. She might be here by okay. five. So Bruce Ehrenhaft has requested an absence. Okay. Uh, a move to accept the absence. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Fullerton seconded. Yes. Ms. Rolando? Yes. 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 Mr. Fullerton? Mr. Menendez? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Mr. Adams, deferrals. Yeah, we have um, two requests for deferrals. Um, the first one is for 517 Aragon Avenue, case file LHD 2022-013. Um, we don't have any issues with this request, and the property owner and his representative are here. Okay. Do you want the next request, or do you want to deal with No, the next request. The next request is for 1710 Hernando Street, historic designation, case file LHD 2022-015. Um, we have no issues with this request, and again, the owner and his representative are here. Are any of these deferrals from last? Were they here last time? Um, both have been deferred before. One, um, 517 Aragon was deferred on the December meeting, and Hernando Street was deferred in the January meeting. So, so why would they be deferred again? Um, we've been working with the applicants on their proposed alterations for the properties. Um, they, they do both do intend, I believe, to submit a COA along with the historic designation okay. review. 
Um, so we have been working closely with them. Um, in particular, um, Hernando Street, they just missed the deadline to actually submit their COE application. They have been to Board of Architects. Um, Aragon, we're trying to work through some things with the, with the property owner. Um, they are both both here, if you... Okay. Really. They, they have been advertised twice now, correct? They have been advertised twice, yes. But do you want to... Hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear. Him. You can hear me on this. No. Yeah. Um, so, given the fact that both of these properties are by the property owner, the the deferral request is from the property owner and the applicant. Neither property is at risk at demolition by neglect. The only injured parties by any further delays is them. So, I would defer the item. Okay. Both cases. Do we need to vote on the deferment or just accept the deferment? You don't need to vote. It could have been deferred at a staff level. Okay. Do either one of them want to speak, or we can just defer it? Okay. Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Any other deferments? No. Okay. Next item is swearing in. If any persons in the audience will be testifying today, please rise to be sworn in. <clears throat> Are you going to testify? Is, are you going to testify? If you're going to testify, stand up. You're going to speak today. If you're going to speak. Okay. First case file, case file LHD 2022-012, consideration of the local historic designation of the property at 1231 Columbus Boulevard, legally described as lot 32 and lot 33, less ST, block 28, revised plat, Coral Gables, Granada section, according to the plat thereof, as recorded in plat book eight, at page 113 of the public records of Miami-Dade County, Florida. Can we run the PowerPoint for item V1.1, case file LHD 2022-012, which is 1231 Columbus Boulevard. The property at 1231 Columbus Boulevard is before you for consideration for designation as a local historic landmark. It is the result of historic significance determination filed by the owner. The single family home was built in 1925. As per Article 8, Section 8-103 of the Coral Gable Zoning Code, criteria for designation, a local historic landmark must have significant character, interest, or value as part of the historical, cultural, archeological, aesthetic, or architectural heritage of the city, state, or nation. For designation, a property must meet one of the criteria outlined in the code. 1231 Columbus Boulevard is eligible as a local historic landmark based on three criteria. Historical cultural significance, criteria four. It exemplifies the historical, cultural, political, economic, or social trends of the community. Architectural significance, criteria one. It portrays the environment and era of history characterized by one or more distinctive architectural style. And criteria two, it embodies those distinguishing characteristics of an architectural style or period or method of construction. The single family residence at 1231 Columbus Boulevard is in the Granada section on a 104 by 110 foot lot at the northwest corner of Columbus Boulevard and Venetia Terrace. George Merrick founded Coral Gables as a fully conceived planned city in the early 1920s. He chose to develop it as a Mediterranean-inspired city since he felt this type of architecture harmonized with South Florida's climate and lifestyle. During the initial development period, structures and amenities were built almost exclusively in this style. In November 1921, the first lots were offered for sale. 
Sales continued at a rapid pace until the devastating hurricane in September 1926. Constructed in 1925, the home at 1231 Columbus Boulevard occurred during this initial phase. It is among the earliest homes in the city and represents Merrick's vision for Coral Gables. Accounts indicate that expanding the development north to the Tamiami Trail was a priority and a hard-fought endeavor for Merrick. As shown in the 1922 map on the left, while Granada Boulevard connected the Tamiami Trail, Merrick only owned the small strips of land to the either side of it in Section F. By 1923, he amassed various tracts and renamed the area the Granada Section. Merrick continued to acquire new portions within the Granada Section area. The map on the right, dating to December 1924, shows Merrick's progress. A major influence on how Merrick developed the Granada Section was a housing shortage that had reached acute levels in the region by the mid-1920s. Up to this point, most of the design and construction of homes in Coral Gables was done by Merrick's workforce. However, given the housing crisis, he began recruiting architects and builders from across the country to work under the oversight of his Coral Gables construction company. He was looking for professionals who shared his vision for Coral Gables, who could mobilize their own workforce and materials, and who agreed to build moderately priced homes or apartment buildings as part of their contracts. One of the first contracts was awarded in June 1925 to a pair of well-established construction firms from Evansville, Indiana, Hoffman Construction and the Evansville Planning Mill. Additional information on them is in the designation report, including some of their works that are listed on the National Register for Historic Places. Part of their contract were a series of moderately priced homes in the Granada section, which included the home at 1231 Columbus Boulevard. Simultaneous to contracting with Hoffman and Johan, Merrick was in final negotiations for acquiring the Granada Terrace section. It abutted the lots along Columbus Boulevard and is denoted here by the red hatched rectangle. It was Merrick's desire to drive interest in this area and Hoffman and Johan obliged. The first several homes they constructed were in this area along Columbus Boulevard as seen in the figure on the right. 1231 Columbus Boulevard was amongst these first homes and is marked by the yellow star. In Coral Gables during the 1920s, building designs combined elements commonly used in Spanish, Moorish, and Italian architecture and has come to be known as the Mediterranean Revival style. As will be illustrated in the following slides, the home at 1231 Columbus Boulevard exhibits numerous Mediterranean Revival character defining features, including but not limited to the ensemble of three round arches separated by a twisted column leading to a small tiled terrace, the bell tower inspired chimney, the projecting front bay with its pointed arch and hood entry assembly, the poor cocher with its segmental arched openings, recessing and projecting bays on all facades, varying roof types with pitch roofs clad in two-piece barrel tile, group casement windows with high profile motons, wing walls, cascading entry step ensemble, paired round vents decoratively centered over windows, and the original cast masonry plaque flanked by narrow rectangular vents on the front facade. As seen in the property survey, this corner property has a one-story single-family home that faces west onto Columbus Boulevard and an auxiliary building at its southeast corner that faces onto Venetia Terrace. The aerial image at the center of the slide is looking southeast, showing the rear of the property. The home has one small addition to the rear, which is located by the red arrow. Other noted alterations include the enclosure of various areas for living space, this includes the original pork share denoted in yellow on the original floor plan in the upper right of the slide. The entry vestibule is hatched in blue and the rear sleeping porch shown in green. Also in the 21st century, there were the previous owner added copious amounts of decorative elements to the facade. Most of these appear to be reversible. The next several slides are current photos of the property. 
On the front facade, note the triple arched openings with its twisted columns and the small terrace. The historic 1940s photo is provided for reference to illustrate that the original features are present. In the upper left, a detail of the column capital illustrates the type of added ornamentation present on the home. In this case, the capital is original and the additional feature was laid on top. In the right photo, note the projecting bay with the wing walls at both ends. The gable roof over the front entry extends seamlessly over the original porcochere and is clad in two-piece barrel tile. Note the pointed arch entry with its original hood and cascading stair. It was originally an open archway leading to the entry vestibule open to the adjacent porcochere. As seen here, the front porcochere opening was reduced to accommodate a window when it was enclosed for living space. The south side retained its original configuration as a series of protruding and receding bays. Fenestration is centered on each bay with a pair of round vents above each assembly. The casement windows appear to be original to the home. The north side of the home sits only a few feet from the property line. The windows are currently covered in hurricane shutters, but this facade also appears to retain its original features. The original rear bay was a screen sleeping porch. The photo on the left shows how the center opening was enlarged to accommodate a door when this space was enclosed for living space. The top photos show the small addition as denoted in blue. At the right is the original back door that was retained north of the addition. When the home was built in 1925, the property was only one lot. There was a one-car garage whose location and front facade are shown in the permit drawings on the left. By 1940, the property had expanded to two lots. The original garage was demolished and a two-car garage with guest quarters was built facing Venetia Terrace. The photos on the right show the current photos of this auxiliary building. In conclusion, the single-family home at 1231 Columbus Boulevard was built in 1925 during the city's initial boom years. It stands as a testament to founder George Merrick's vision for a Mediterranean-inspired city and his dedication to providing affordable, high-quality, middle-class housing. It is one of a series of modest homes built in the early 1920s, which were smaller in size, but were built with the same high-quality construction and features as other structures that shaped the new city. This home was designed and built by the Indiana-based firms of Hoffman Construction and the Evansville Planing Mill under the aegis of Merrick's Coral Gables Construction Company. The property at 1231 Columbus Boulevard retains its historic integrity and is part of a collection of quality buildings that serves as a visible reminder of the history and cultural heritage of the city. Hence, staff recommends approval for the local historic designation of the property at 1231 Columbus Boulevard based on its historical, cultural, and architectural significance. We do have um, two letters of support for the designation, one from Karelia Carbonell, Historic Preservation Association of Coral Gables, and one from Mr. Brett Gillis. Okay. Uh, the applicant? Um, I do not. You're the prop. You're the prop Good afternoon. My name is Juan Berry with the offices at 2640 South Berkshire Drive. I will, I've been retained as the architect for the renovation of the house and given the chance that we have the board here, and I just want to ask a couple of questions. My client intends to renovate this beautiful house as best possible, but my question is regarding the auxiliary building, because as you understand, this house is quite small, and that's the family over there that owns the house, and they would like to, the house to grow somehow. So my recommendation is obviously the auxiliary building, which is not really historical, it was built in 1948, could be the building that can grow and somehow 
be attached in, in a very nice way to the rear of this property, maintaining the main facade of Columbus and Venetia uh, as historical as possible. So just for clarification, if, 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 if the property is designated historical, do all the structures in the property are designated historical? That's my question. Yes. Yes? OK. And w w does the board see an issue in, the, in growing the auxiliary building? I know that we're not seeking approval. We're, not see we're seeking an you opinion. You would have to submit a design. Exactly, OK. For us to review. So, but all the buildings become historical. Yes. Including the perimeter wall. So we it is it is the property. Yeah, the staff to let you know it is the site. It is the it's property. It's the site. That's what I wanted to clarify yes. for my clients so we have a, a, an understanding of the of the labor we have in front of us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Any questions? Um, one question for staff, the uh, just for clarification the decorative elements that were added to the That's building, <laughs> um, the staff report said they were possibly reversible. In the future, if the applicant comes back with a COA, staff, I hope staff, or I'm asking if staff would request that the applicant remove the non historical elements that were added afterwards, or how does that conversation happen with the applicant? I believe they will be coming forward with a COA for alterations, so that's maybe something that could be could be brought up at that at that point while while you're reviewing their alterations to the to the property. Um, that's probably the the most appropriate time to to do it. Well, it um, as the architect did mention, one of the things that I uh, would recommend in a COA, I don't know if I can do that at this time, is the building, as you said, is is pretty beautiful, uh, and the later sort of additional elements, I think, detract from the original historic nature of the property. So one of the things you can do when you come back is to make an effort to bring the um, the original house back more to its original state. Any other questions, comments? Let the record show that Mr. Durana has joined us. Welcome, Mr. Durana. Any motions? Move to approve. Move to approve the case file LDH 2022-012 as the local uh, historic property, 1231 Columbus Boulevard, legally described as lot 32 and lot 33 less. Um, ST. Less ST, block 28. Yep. Size plat, et cetera. Do I have a second? Based on? Based on? I think it's ba based on the staff report. Um, based on the staff report. Historical, okay. cultural, and architectural significance. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Rolando seconds it. Ms. Rolando? Yes. Mr. Garcia Pons? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Ms. Spain? Yes. Mr. Fullerton? Yes. Mr. Durana? Um, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. If you believe you've reviewed enough information that you can provide a fair and impartial decision on the fact pattern and you believe that you can approve the motion, then you can vote. Okay. Yeah, I read the report, so I'm good. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Menendez? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Next case, special certificate of appropriateness, case file COASP 2022-038, an application for the issuance of a special certificate of appropriateness for the property at Balboa Plaza, a local historic landmark located at the intersection of Coral Way, a local and state designated highway and contributing resource within the Coral Way Historic District, DeSoto Boulevard, South Greenway Drive, and Anderson Road. The application requests design approval for the alteration of the historic street grid and the introduction of vehicular roundabout. OK, 
Okay. This application requests a recommendation of approval for the alteration of the street grid and the introduction of a vehicular roundabout. An amendment to the Coral Gable Zoning Code to allow for the designation of the city plan as historic was adopted in 2018. The Zoning Code requires that any amendments to the city plan shall be reviewed by the Historic Preservation Board, who will make a recommendation for a special COA to City Commission. The City Commission will ultimately render the decision whether to grant or deny the issuance of the COA. Um, and each request for an amendment to the city plan will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the, the, the proposed alterations include removal of the existing triangular traffic islands and the installation of a roundabout with new traffic islands with crosswalks and minor road realignment. The applicant's letter of intent has stated that the intersection has changed through the years, except for the northeast quadrant, which contains the Granada Golf Course. The existing conditions have no demarcated pedestrian crossings or pedestrian connectors on any approach. Eastbound and westbound vehicular directions are free flow, while northbound and southbound directions are controlled by stop signs. So the improvements will include a two-way stop control will be removed, a roundabout will be implemented, new crosswalks will be added, the green area will be expanded, and the lighting will be proposed. The applicant has further provided traffic data, Coral Gables population data, and a safety analysis with a recommendation from Miami-Dade County Engineering Division who validated the proposal through a traffic operational analysis which concluded that a traffic circle is recommended at the study intersection as a traffic calming device will mitigate the angle crashes occurring at the subject intersection. Um, so any material amendments have to be reviewed by you. And the Historic Preservation Board is tasked with considering the appropriateness of the amendment to the city plan while taking into consideration three things, the historic integrity of the city plan and the effect of the proposed amendment on the historic integrity, development and the public purpose being served by the amendment. No variances are requested. The proposal does not require Board of Architects review. Um, the staff conclusion is the application requests a recommendation of approval. The board is tasked with considering those three things I mentioned. In support of the application, the applicant has provided details on previous changes to the intersection, which impacted the integrity of the site when compared with the historic plat map provided. Um, they provided information on the population increase of Coral Gables over recent years and provided a list of public benefits associated with the proposal. So while all of the above should be considered by the board, it's the opinion that the proposed roundabout is a major alteration to the city plan. There is less concern with the introduction of crosswalks and the minor road realignment, um, but there is concerns about the actual roundabout. Stafford recommends that the applicant explore other options for traffic control and pedestrian safety at or near the intersection, which would have a less significant impact on the historic street plan. So the recommendation is for deferral. And we do have some historic um, images of the intersection here. This is the 1920s. 1920s looking northwest. That's from 1954. And that's it. The applicant um, is here, and they do have a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. This one's forward, this one's back, and that's the pointer. So you can oh. point to it and show it here as well. Oh. If you can point to it.
Good afternoon. My name is Yannick Fernandez. I am representing the Miami-Dade County Department of Transportation and Public Works. And um, the reason why we're here is to present to you the improvements to the intersection of Coralway and Anderson. This um, Coralway is designated historic through the state and the county. However, the restrictions that you can see in here is, is they are in terms of funding. Um, you can, we are not supposed to spend state funds for these improvements, and these improvements are being uh, funded by RIF monies, because in this case, this type of uh, feature increases capacity. Um, these are so, some old photographs of how the area has changed, or back then how the area looked. Basically, um, the the three corners have changed somehow. The the one on the northeast where you have the golf course has been the same. Some additional photographs from 2007, aerial photographs. Um, this is 2022. And in trying to um, searching for data, how the volume and the population has changed, you can see, um, even though I, um, I was not able to um, find all data, but since Coral Gables was created, the volume has increased considerably. Uh, with respect to the population from the 90s to right now, um, it has gone from 41,000 to 51,000. Uh, these are the existing conditions. As you know, Coral Way is a free flow road, and um, the intersection is controlled by the, on the side streets by, by stop signs. So it's stop, two way stop control the intersection. There are no pedestrian crossings. And here we're looking at eastbound and westbound. There are no crossings, and there's no control along Coral Way. This project, this project was initiated um, actually by residents and by city um, in order to improve angle crashes at the intersection. As part of the evaluation, um, we looked at the, at, the, um, at the actual capacity of the intersection. So the capacity in the AM will increase given this, this, uh, this improvement. The, Angle crashes definitely, the, a roundabout definitely takes care of angle crashes, and this is why, the main reason why this improvement was proposed. And at the same time, we are proposing crossings on all sides um, that right now you, you don't have. The proposed uh, improvements here are just basically um, Maintain the number of lanes in each direction. We're not doing any widening here. We're going to, in order to implement the roundabout, we're proposing drainage improvements. Uh, we are proposing um, lighting, and you're going to have landscaping in the roundabout and on the island. Something else, if you notice in here, your, your green area is going to increase. Uh, versus the amount of asphalt that you have there now. Do, do I wait for any questions now? Or? Okay. <laughs> yeah, just like I mentioned, if you compare the, 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 the layout, the, the green area is going to be sing significantly increased. We have to, in case you might have some questions of, of, of the actual design of the roundabout, we are tied here to existing historic items on this road, which are the, the, the columns on the fountain that you have there on the southeast corner. Um, and, and this is the reason why the layout look, looks like this, because we are, we are restricted mainly on the west side by the, by the columns. In terms of landscaping, what the county proposes is just your regular landscaping on, on the roundabout. Any additional features, uh, flowers, or any specific landscaping will have to be 
uh, funded by the city. And with the lighting as well, we provide standard lighting, any specific decorative lighting or anything more detailed will have to be funded by the city. Thank you so much. We have received one um, letter in opposition to the, to the proposal. It's from the Historic Preservation Association of Coral Gables from Corellia Martinez Carbonell. So I have copies here. Would you like me to read it into the record or just give you a copy to? You can just give us a copy. Could you tell me how the lighting will affect the nearby residents? Um, we, at this point, we do not have the design for the lighting yet. That was just, um, I'm not sure whether I can go back, but that, that was just a sample of a similar um, roundabout designed a, at some other location. So th this is not Corway and Anderson, but okay. definitely, definitely you're going to need to have lighting at the roundabout, mm -hmm. and you're going to need to have lighting on the approaches. But there's nothing designed as of this point? No. Mr. Adams, has, has our zoning department taken a look at this? I... Planning, zoning, no? I, have you... We, have, we haven't submitted to zoning or planning. No, we haven't. Oh. What about public works? Uh, we have coordinated with public works. But, but the lighting, just keep in mind that the lighting plants are not they're not, they have not been prepared yet. Well, under so. Understood, but I would feel more comfortable our public works department taking a look at this before we did and giving their, you know. We have been in coordination with public works with respect to the circle. Okay. For the lighting, not. not. Do we have anybody here from public works? No. Have you spoken to anybody in public works regarding this? I don't believe I have spoken to anyone in public works. Okay. And we have um, coordination with the city public works department as the city requested these improvements. The city requested these improvements? Yeah. When the, was that? Um, well, we have various dates. It's been, been requested since back from 2004, 2006. So it has yeah, been. Yeah, I remember. O originally, <laughs> originally, the city was going to do the roundabout, and the county was going to provide funding. But then that was somehow canceled through the city. It never happened. It came back to us I was part again. of that. I'm totally against a uh, um, circle at this location or anywhere along Coral Way. I think it, it's inappropriate. It, this is a main historic uh, roadway. It was designated as a state historic roadway, and that's about funding. Totally understand that, but it's locally desi designated because it's part of the plan of the city. It may be designated also because it's uh, part of the um, district. And this will totally change. I mean, do you have um, the reports on accidents on these uh, in this location? Um, as part of our, with me, I have Jamile Senespleda from the Traffic Engineering Division, and uh, you can they get it from the police department. They, 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 every time they do an evaluation, they look at the historical data on base right. and right. to to make but sure. Is that, that why you're here? Because people are crashing all the time in this, uh, uh, in this, or they're running over pedestrians or something? Because I think it'll harm the aesthetics of the city. I mean, there must be a better way. Certainly a crosswalk wouldn't. Put the crosswalks in, the, the, the pedestrians will, will be safer. But doing this is, in my view, totally inappropriate. With respect to additional improvements, uh, crosswalks have been requested before, um, specific, um, either regular crossings or uh, the, the ones that are RFB, the ones that have the lights. Yeah. And the, the, the evaluation that was done concluded that the, the counts for pedestrians that have in the intersections are not sufficient to, to propose that crossing. Oh, along so there are not enough away. Um, pedestrians there to propose yeah. that. I'll, I'll. Good afternoon. Hi. Hey, Donna, how are you? Uh, so I'm Jamilet Sanespleda. I'm the chief of the Traffic Engineering Division, a former city employee. So I'm familiar with... Uh, 
with a history of, of this runabout. So basically, um, as uh, Janik and Donna mentioned, back in 2004, 2005, um, the city wanted to to proceed with a runabout, but during all these years, there has been a back and forth. Uh, the county had in the TIP, in the, um, in the brief pro uh, program, uh, $200,000 aside for this project, which uh, I would say maybe after 2008 or something like that was put on hold. So, but then, the city said, okay, we are not going to move forward with this. But lately, I would say two years ago, one year and a half or something like that, the assistant city manager, Peter Iglesias, and the, public, no, uh, no. the city public works department, they decided that, yes, we want to move forward with the, the runabout. It was probably so, sometime after December of 2019 when that came up. Uh -huh. So then uh, that was why we once again consider the to use those funds to design the runabout and since we have been working on the design so it's nothing that the county has imposed it is being like a city request that the county has been working on so and then public works yes they have been involved uh, all the time and also bear in mind you're making a recommendation to commission so you do not have the final say. This it's the city commission that actually makes the final, the final right, um, approval of the COA. Okay. Um, so I think Ms. Spain asked a question about pedestrian fatalities and accidents, and I know that you take that into consideration when designing. Do you have that data? Does anybody have that data? I mean, typically we have a slide or something. I don't have it with me. I can provide it later if you want us to send an email or something. Because as we said through the years, there were also requests for providing a crosswalk where the bus stop is like east of uh, uh, North Greenway, Anderson Road. So I remember twice the city requested the county to have a crosswalk at that location because of accidents and pedestrian activities and the bus stop and the golf course, etc. So at that time, the county, when, when I was a city employee, the county twice denied the request because there was not enough uh, pedestrian volumes, etc. So that died. Um, previously, maybe 2005, a signal was also um, kind of like evaluated at that location. And then it was another no. So I don't really know what's the you guys' um, idea about the signal, because I know that Granada and Coral Ways has been also in the works with a signal versus runabout. So, uh, but yes, yeah, so we have been working with, a, with the accident data. And that is one of the reasons the, the improvement is being uh, considered here. If I can follow up. So it, it, it if you don't have the information, I can't vote. You know, I mean, I, 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 if, if the reason is safety, then let's have that conversation, but I don't know that to be true, right? So let's, um, my, um, I would not be, of interest, I would not be able to um, vote up or down on this today, because it is, it's a big change, and if it's solving a massive problem, let's consider it. If not, let's not. I, I'm also interested in, in staffs thinking about what the alternatives are um, but one thing I can say as, as a user of that intersection, I never cross there because it's impossible, which means that you're not going to get the pedestrian counts of people crossing the street because it's impossible. So that, that data is self-fulfilling. Um, and I don't think it's a, a great example of people aren't doing it because it's not safe. So people aren't doing it. And I'm sure there would be people who would like to do it. Um, and I would love to see that correction somehow. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the best solution, but I, I personally would need that traffic, um, pedestrian fatality and traffic data. Yeah, and, and that is something to, for you to keep in mind that there are not a lot of options that we have to improve the, the safety of that intersection. So if the city wants to proceed with, let's say, a crossing, okay, 
A crossing has to be controlled somehow. So if not, it's like we are doing nothing. So whatever. Pu public, public works are going to join us by Zoom. Wow, how clever. Ooh, clever. While we're waiting, may I ask a question? Do you have traffic counts for uh, South Greenway and for Anderson, what, what those turning movements are? Yes, we have, but I don't have them so here. You, you, More than happy to share, but I don't have them here. Okay. So this plaza uh, is individually designated. I mean, it's, the plazas are designated as uh, historic landmarks. The um, roadway is uh, historic as part of a historic district and also as part of the plan of the city. So, you know, it's a fairly important piece of history. You know, another thing I'm thinking about is along Coral Way, there are a number of north-south streets that um, where they cross Coral Way, there are plazas. I know um, Columbus Boulevard, there is uh, Alhambra. There, uh, so, I mean, are we, one thing I'm concerned about, are we going to end up getting a request for Absolutely. a circle at each one of these? We already these? have. Staff already has received those. I received it when I was staff. Oh. So I think uh, the old uh, camel's nose in the tent analogy may be appropriate here. Um, but I, I, um, I, I'd like to see the data of why, because in my mind, there's other intersections that are um, more challenging than this one. But, um, I, I, I need to know information. And so I would appreciate seeing like the traffic counts at different times of the um, day and also um, fatality or accident reports. Mr. Adams. And just to clarify the type of accidents that kind of generated or supported this improvement were angle angle crashes, uh, vehicles. So a vehicle um, hitting another vehicle. They were not specifically pedestrian um, okay. crashes, well, right? Right, which is why we just need to see the information. Yeah. Is Public Works going to get on? That's exactly what I was over there doing. OK, well. Uh, this gentleman is. If I, if I can address the, I mean, I, I didn't sort in because I didn't know. I'm a resident. Name. State your name. Uh, Carlos Miquilarena, I live. 2401 Anderson Road, I see that intersection from my window. Sorry, did you say you were or were not sworn in? I was not sworn in, sorry. No. I was kind of sworn in now. <coughs> okay, yes. I, I, in a way, I was the one that initiated all this issue. Uh, a good, uh, the daughter of a good friend of mine almost was killed on that intersection trying to cross, there is a, if you look at that intersection, there is only, it's called way people are speeding up, like 50, 60, 60 miles per hour. And you have North Greenway, and, and on the other side, you have Anderson Road, and people try to cross the street. It's impossible. I tell my daughters, do not take that intersection, just go all the way down and go to Granada and do something else. But people do. People are going to try to cross it because it's faster. So this, this lady was coming. Uh, it's really hard to see when you are coming from North Greenway to see who's coming on Coral Way, it's impossible. You can't, there is a canopy of trees, it's very dark, it's very difficult, and she was, I mean, you're just waiting there on a stop sign, seeing cars pass by, pass by, pass by, and you're nothing. So she looked around, she thought she was coming, she got in and 
She got knifed and the car almost flipped. She ended up in the hospital. And this is probably the 10 or 12 accidents I see. I witness. I took videos of some of them. I saw a car flipped and ended up in the golf course. It is, it is very dangerous. So I, went, I came to the city. I requested, I did a public request for records for accidents to intersection from 2019 to 2020. COVID already started until 2022. And it was probably, I don't remember correctly, it was like probably 45 to 50 accidents in that period when there's no traffic. Right, traffic was reduced, there was less people circulating, and you see accidents happening all the time. And I don't know if a roundabout is the right thing to do. Oh, it could be, the problem is if you put a traffic light there, then you're gonna have, like, I think there's a traffic light on Granada, right? So you're gonna see cars backing up on each side of the roads, right? If you put a, a, a traffic light up. If you, do, if you put up pedestrian crosses, as you said, without anything else, forget about it, nobody's gonna cross the street, you're gonna get killed for sure. So something needs to be done there, and I think the, the idea of the city of Roundabout, I know it's a big change, but it looks like the right thing to do. I think it's, there, is a, there is already a roundabout in Segovia, right? And that's Coral Way. In Segovia and Coral Way, you build a roundabout there. You put a, even a, a sculptor there. So there are roundabouts. There are ways to do this in a proper way, and I think something needs to be done there fast before someone gets killed there. I, I, in the data I got, no one was killed. I didn't see any fatalities but there were really bad accidents. So that, that's just my, my view. Thanks. Public works are, are on. No, public works first, please. Good afternoon. We can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi, this is Melissa Desais. I'm the Senior Transportation Engineer for Public Works. Melissa, can you turn on your video so that you can be sworn in? Would you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you will provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so we have been working with the county regarding this intersection um, for quite some time. We've done our research. This this seems to be the best um, option for this intersection. Um, I'm here for any questions that you might have regarding the um, the changes that are being proposed, but based on our coordination with the police department, you know, um, and with the county, the roundabout seems like the safest alternative. It will provide um, connectivity for pedestrians at this intersection, which is critical, and it will reduce the conflict movements at this intersection, um, which would help to greatly reduce the accidents that are found at this location. I have a question. Can you tell us how many accidents occur and what type in any one year? And not just the um, highest, but give us a range for the last 10 since it, or more since this has been on the board since about 15 years. If you give me a few minutes, I can check. Uh, unfortunately, I was not aware that this, this presentation was going on today, um, but I do have that information. I just have to find it. Okay, we'd also like the turning <laughs> movements also to Anderson and on to uh, Greenway. The turning movements for Anderson onto Greenway? For those two streets. Okay. So in other words, you've Let got one, two, you've got a number of directions on there, but your turning movements and your estimated pedestrian crossings. We have a study that was conducted. I do not have the information in front of me right now. I do know that based on what our consultant told us, at that intersection, there was enough pedestrian activity to warrant a crosswalk. I just have numbers in front of me. 
um, regarding the incidents. Let me see if I can find that information. Excuse me, interrupt. Um, Mr. Chair, we just heard like conflicting information between the city and the county. I, I would recommend a deferral so that we can get the information correct and do this properly at the next meeting. Make a just, motion. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be deferred. I would like to make a motion to defer this item to the next meeting with the information that we requested of the county, perhaps give Thanks. the county Thank additional you. information that we're interested in getting for the next meeting and the city public works department as well as city staff um, information regarding the designations of specifically the plazas and not just the map. I think the, the yeah. more information we have from the historic preservation department on the specific designations of these areas are great and the more information we get from the applicants with regards to the data of you know the impetus of why we're doing this what's the rationale for doing it and then what other options were explored prior to the roundabout these are all things that are incredibly important i would also hope that in this interim time the applicant has time to speak with the historic preservation department and not just the public works department to talk about any potential historically appropriate options that may be available um, and I think we all understand that this intersection is difficult, um, but it's also important. So let's let's just get it right, and let's not try to do it on the fly yeah. today. And so I, have when, a, I have a question. Well, he's got a motion. Let's, let's yeah, do the motion. Is that a motion? motion? Okay. That's a motion to defer. Okay. I don't know if there's second. a second. Yeah. Ms. Rolando seconds. <laughs> Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Ms. Spain? Yes. Mr. Fullerton? Yes. Mr. Durana? Yes. Ms. Rolando? Yes. Mr. Garcia Pond? Yes. Mr. Menendez? Yes. We we still have someone on Zoom so that if, wanted to speak on the well, if we can you know one of the things is provide the questions that we are going to have and provide it to staff and the applicants so that they can come prepared at the next meeting. I think Ms. Spain had something. Uh, is, this is just process. Um, I understand that as part of the city plan, this would be a recommendation to the city commission, but this is a landmark. So it should be presented to us, I think, as a certificate of appropriateness uh, for, for a, um, alteration to a historic, locally historic landmark and with a staff recommendation. I mean, I think that that's appropriate. I, I don't know, talk to legal counsel and, and figure out how to do that because you can't just, I don't know. I think that, that, that there should be more as far as a recommendation from staff. That's number one. And number two, I, I'd like to see alternatives to the circle. I mean, I get that I'm not a traffic engineer, <laughs> but quite possibly the road could be narrowed or something. I don't know. Uh, so that it becomes uh, um, better you know slow, slowing traffic maybe the pavement can change because the then cars will know they're in an intersection something i think can happen that won't be so jarring uh to when, when you hit this and every other intersection on coral way that's going to come before us but um, i think to, if i can piggyback on that the uh, Maybe one option to explore is, I mean, I mean, I know South Greenway and Anderson, the traffic is not the same as what you have on Coral Way. Maybe we make South Greenway a right turn only onto Coral Way and Anderson a right turn only onto Coral Way with maybe that mixed with a crosswalk, no. something like that, so we don't have to do the circle. Very, I think that would be less. That's a good idea. We, I, I worked for a long time on DeSoto Fountain uh, because there were they came to me and said it had to be altered, and and so that was one of the options that I thought worked really well. That was a, yeah, that's a maybe good idea. that mixed with a crosswalk, you know, maybe like something less obtrusive, oh. like a, a secondary option. I, I would hope that when they come back, somebody from the city is here, from Public Works, and from the county, so that our questions can be answered. Seems to me also that the Coral Way and Granada is another one of those intersections. Something else. Just to <laughs> okay. Well, it's been deferred until the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. If 
they're there. It's been deferred. Okay, so who, who's going to be the contact person that we can send the information to? Send it to me. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get your email. Yep. Thank you. But I think what uh, Donna has said and uh, Cesar, we need the data and we need uh, alternative approaches be, no. uh, so that we have, um, we can make an intelligent, informed decision. Or, or even the ones that were discarded. Right? I mean, you said this is the best solution. What were the ones that were discarded? Like, what's the rationale for this solution? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it, it does seem appropriate to have a certificate of appropriateness. Yeah, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to think how we do that if that's two two separate applications because it's two two different things. One you can approve and or deny, and the other you make a recommendation uh -huh. to to approve or deny. So I'll need to speak with legal about how we how we do that. Okay, Nancy, is somebody on the line or no? She submitted a letter already. Hello? Hello? Hi. Yeah, um, I just heard that the item, this is Carelia Martinez Carbonell. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Preservation Association of Coral Gables. I understand the item uh, on the Balboa Plaza has been deferred, but I do want to um, very much agree with Ms. Bain and um, just underline the importance of this historic landmark. Uh, it's not only part of the historic uh, map and, it's, and the city grid, but um, it's an individual historic landmark. It was actually one of the first uh, entrances or plazas designed by Denman Fink and, um, and Mr. Button um, back in 1922. Um, this is one of the earliest uh, designed um, and envisioned by George Merrick. So please, I, I just, um, you have the letter there from our organization, um, but I, I want to thank all of you for for really taking this uh, and deferring it for further review, um, because this is a very important landmark and it should not be altered or tampered with. Um, and and I, I am surely hopeful that other solutions can be found. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next case file, COA SP 2023-002, an application of the issuance of a special certificate of appropriateness for the property at 1117 Castile Avenue, a contributing resource within Castile Avenue Plaza Historic District, legally described as lots 15 and 16, block 11, Coral Gable, section C, according to the plat thereof, as recorded in plat book eight at page 26 of the public records of Miami-Dade County, Florida. The application requests to sign approval for the installation of an S-tile roof. Thank you. Says location map of the property in question. Um, it is considered a contributing resource within the Castile Avenue slash Plaza Historic District. It was designed um, uh, from a permit issued in 1937 by the firm of Kenel and Elliott. Um, a permit was applied for in December of 2022 to replace the existing tile on the roof with an S tile. Um, staff rejected at the um, review level and noting that it needed to be a two piece barrel tile as was originally on the house. The um, owner wishes to install the S tile. From our um, end, the last permit that was located for re roofing for the residents um, for an S tile was issued in 2000, which was prior to the designation of the historic district. Um, and we find that the work that is proposed does detract from the, the house and the standards. Um, it was built in the Mediter Mediterranean transitional style. There are very few um, design elements. They, were, they tend to be a lot scarcer and a lot sparser than Med Revival. 
uh, the roof is considered a character defining feature of the property and um, we recommend denial. I believe that the owner is here. So, oh, sorry, this is a photo of the property now, just so you can see. Good afternoon, board. Um, the Jeff Gordon, owner, the roof on the house currently is an S-tile roof um, in consistency with other S-tile roofs in the immediate neighborhood under the same historic designation. And our intent is just to restore exactly what is in place today. Uh, are there questions as to, or I'm curious to know as to why there's a denial from the historic preservation on this request? This tile is not the original roof to the, it's not the original but, tile to the roof. But previously was installed on the roof. We've not changed the roof from our ownership. So it was not either designated historic at the time, I guess is the point in question when the roof was done last, but the roof has been on for, I was told from the inspection for 26 years. So um, distract, detracting from the aesthetic of the house, I think would be a, a, a differing opinion given the, the nature of other houses consistent in the area with the same S tile roof of the same color and uh, intent to maintain the exact same aesthetic as it was today and previously. Any of the board members have any comments? This is hard. A, a point to note as well, <coughs> in addition. Let's just start. I mean, we have this issue come up practically every other meeting. I'd also like to make note that um, from a general wind and um, water, it was, it's been made aware to me, and I'm by no means a roofer, but it's been made aware to me that the roof that was put on the house 26 years ago um, it, and previously approved, that is better for both wind and water protection of the historic residents, which we intend to wholeheartedly protect. We have, we have a number of examples of other historic houses in the area with the exact same uh, S-tile roof in color. Mr. Adams or Kara, would you like to explain the, the, uh, the department's uh, you know, policy on, on the uh, S-tile? Um, the department or staff can only review and approve the original roof covering, right? If an applicant wishes to do something which is not the original roof covering, it has to come to the board. Our practice is to explain to applicants that process and also explain to applicants, well, I certainly do, that in my two years here, I have never seen the board approve an S-tile but we cannot stop an applicant submitting an application and coming right. here. But it, but it is fully explained prior to someone coming to the board and, and if the property owner chooses to do so, then, then So basically can. the S-tile is not what was original on your roof. Okay. And that's what's required. So when you do your re-roofing, as you're doing now, it's required that you put on what the original roof was and and i'd also i don't know whether you were in south florida of I, I, hurricane I, andrew I, I, i'm born and raised i i get okay. it so um right after hurricane andrew it was impossible to get uh true uh two-piece barrel tile okay. for a few years i don't know how long it was but it was for a long long time so a lot of the roofs you see uh, out there that are uh, historically um, designated now. Um, maybe they just couldn't find the, the S-type, but, but we're, so, we're correcting that now because it absolutely should be a two-piece barrel tile. And once you have that on your roof, there's a huge difference, really a huge difference. 
So, ma'am. Yeah. So, come on, come on up. <laughs> Please state your name. Sorry, Taryn Gordon. Maybe part of why Have it you was been sworn in. Yeah, I did. Okay, okay. this one. Okay. Did you? Yeah. Um, maybe part of why that was so hard to get was because, as our roofer explained to us, the real difference is that the two pieces over time, like the roof doesn't last as long and are more likely to have the wear and tear and become projectiles in a hurricane. So like, like we said, we love the look of the house. We yeah. want to keep the integrity. We just also want it to be functional and last as long as it should. You know, there are some uh, roofs on homes in Coral Gables that are, are the original two-piece barrel tile. Right. So, you know, lasts a fairly long time. But yeah, we like like I said, we it's not a matter of we, we like the look of it. It's just we want it to be efficient and when we have we brought in three different roofers and got tons of quotes, et cetera. And when we bought the house, my husband was like, Oh, it's historic. That's not gonna be fun. <laughs> and I was like, No, it'll be fine and we made calls in asking about certain things and what we were told is how the house looks as we purchased it was how it had to continue to look which what's on there now is, like you said. Which yes, was not. wrong. Right. Okay. So I have a question as it relates to historic homes in general. Every home that was done with an S-tile roof before the historic designation that now comes up for a new roof is dealing with exactly the same problem. Yes. Yeah. We're and very they come consistent. here every meeting, and every meeting we tell them they need to put the, 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 you know, the, tile, back. the tile back on. So every every... S tile roof will be converted to a barrel Hopefully. tile roof if it has yep. If they're historic and if and if it's appropriate, if it's a Mediterranean home, I mean if it was uh, a nineteen forties or fifties ranch style home that's designated, then no. But on the original homes built in nineteen twenties that are Mediterranean, that's what we've been very consistent with. And just so you know, um, your roof is really not the tile. That's just to, understood. That's just to protect the roof. I and so it. it's what's underneath that that counts. And so that's where you really want to get with your roofer. Yeah, we, we've got a good one. I'm not concerned about that. Um, their, their recommendation to us was the best tile as from a protection standpoint as well. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, need to we, need to, uh, we need a motion and we need to vote. So do I have a motion from anybody? Yes, I'll make the motion. Uh, motion to um, deny case file COASP 2023-002, an application for the issuance of a special certificate of occupancy for the property located at 1117 Castile Avenue, contributing resource within the Castile Avenue Plaza Historic District, legally described as lots 15, 16, et cetera. Request denies on the basis of S-tile roof not compatible with historic character of property. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Orlando seconds it. Uh, Mr. Maxwell said certificate of occup occupancy instead of certificate of appropriateness. Is that what I said? Certificate <laughs> of appropriateness. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Durana? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Ms. Spain? Yes. Mr. Fullerton? Yes. Ms. Rolando? Yes. Mr. Garcia Pons? Yes. Mr. Menendez? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Next case file COASP 2023 003, an application for the issuance of a special certificate of appropriateness for the property at 1200 Anastasia Avenue, the Biltmore Hotel, a local and national historic landmark. A lengthy legal description is on file in the Historic Resources Department. The, application, the applicant is requesting design approval for additions and alterations to the Golf Operation Building. So the application is for design approval for additions and alterations to the Golf Operation Building. The applicant the proposed work consists of an addition to the members lounge to the east elevation of the east wing, an addition to the 19th hole cafe to the west elevation of the west wing, an addition to the locker room in the centre of the north elevation, 
an extension of the terrace on the south elevation. Um, construction of the additions will replicate the existing architectural style, including the extension of the covered terraces. The roof tile will match the existing type and colour blend, and the new windows and doors will match the existing in colour and design. The proposed paint colour scheme will match the Biltmore. So, as it says in the report, there is a proposed addition to the members' lounge on the east wing, which does require some demolition of the existing east wall and partial roof dem demolition. Um, addition to the west wing will require some demolition of the existing west wall and partial roof demolition. The addition to the locker room will be to the um, centre of the north elevation and will require demolition of the existing portico and partial demolition of the north wall. The proposed addition, however, will replicate the existing portico. On either side of the portico will be two circular windows. And on the south elevation, the existing terrace wall will be demolished and a new terrace wall will be constructed to accommodate a wider terrace. So this gives you an impression of the building on the south elevation facing the golf course and on the north elevation facing the hotel. Mm. And that is the portico that will be taken down, extended and um, replicated. We don't have a, an exact date of construction um, for this building. However, aerial photographs show that it was built between 1986 and 1994. It's not original to the Biltmore Complex plan. The proposal was reviewed and approved by the Board of Architects on January the 12th, 2023. The proposed additions are in keeping with the style of the existing structure. There's no negative impact to the historic structures in the Biltmore complex. We're recommending approval with um, four conditions there. Um, and I believe the applicant is here. I think that building was designed by Subrata Basu. I believe. Sue Broda, he worked in the Public Works Department, then he worked down in South Miami. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Tom Prescott with the Biltmore Hotel. Um, and I would, of course, never dispute Miss Spain in any of the comments <laughs> that she makes on the years. Oh, please. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you. I want to uh, just come up and obviously make note of myself and my family's charge with obviously this landmark of the asset that we have here with the Biltmore Hotel and the golf course that adjoins it. As Mr. Adams mentioned, this is in relation to the golf building and not the Biltmore Hotel, just to clarify. So that's 1210 Anastasia Avenue instead of 1200. But I'm here as a resource to answer any questions you all have, but I know you'll want to hear from John Olson with Peacock and Lewis, the architect that put this together for you all. So uh, for the record, John Olson, architect with Peacock and Lewis. Good evening. Um, I have um, two pieces of information that you have um, one of, I believe, this is the piece that you have that describes more technically um, the nature of the renovation and additions. What I'm showing you this evening is a little bit more reference to the existing building photos uh, and what we plan to do. Um, we were given a charge to look at the building, understand the efficiencies that might be had, uh, as well as enhance um, guest and member experience. Um, and to that end, we looked at the locker rooms, the 19th hole, uh, the member lounge, the terraces, which are a big part of the experience there, which looks out on the short game golf. Um, and looking at that, we wanted to perhaps solve some of the ugly aspects of, um, you know, back of house stuff. Um, if you've played golf there, you know that when you come into that environment, you're walking right past the cart staging area. So all the cleaning supplies, all that sort of thing is pretty much, you know, out in the open. So this, um, certainly with Tom's guidance, we were able to come up with a plan that allowed us to put that actually in the cart barn because we we're extending the 19th hole above it. So we're actually going to take the cart washing and all of that stuff put it down below so the only thing you'll see is a ramp that goes down to the lower level these are some pictures of the terrace uh, on both sides actually and it's got a heavy timber uh, ceiling um, and uh, cast stone columns again this is mediterranean not mediterranean revival um, it um, it's sympathetic to the hotel 
um, but in no way does it match the uh, beautiful architecture of the hotel. Um, one of the pieces that we are actually not touching is that main entry stair up to the pro shop. Um, that's going to remain um, with some improvements. Um, some of the railings need to um, be attended to. Um, but um, if you look, that's a picture um, of that cart staging area. So it's, it's our hope that all of those types of things that um, are required for uh, replenishing um, the golf carts will be happening down below now, as well as the cart washing. Um, this um, couple of pieces of this building that um, reference Mediterranean architecture, of course, is the um, barrel tile, um, cast stone columns, cast stone detailing or stone detailing, um, the um, um, archways, um, albeit if you see in this one picture of the existing uh, loggia, uh, on, the, on what I call the back side of the building, the thickness of those walls um, we think um, should be enhanced so that we're, we're putting two widths of, of block on that. So it'll read much more substantial. We expect to reuse the emblem up on the top. Um, and um, these are a couple of more pictures um, just showing you some of the back of house stuff. Um, I don't know if you can read this drawing too well but it describes what we're doing to the site and the building itself uh, in terms of demolition. So um, my, this slide, if you, I don't, does this have a, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, here too? Okay. Good, good. Thank you. Um, so the two ends of the building, if you see here uh, where I'm pointing to, this area over here, those two kind of grayish uh, components on the site plan, is specifically where we're adding 800 square feet to enhance the program. Basically, we're stretching the building, uh, and that's what we're doing architecturally. So the loggias will be heavy timber framing, cast stone columns matching all of the existing materials. So hopefully when we're done, it's going to look better, but it will look very much the same as what you see today. Um, and the other area that we are adding on to, of course, oops, is this back piece. And we are recreating the loggia and you can see where the thickness of the walls back there. And we are actually taking some stone and wrapping, I'll show you in a rendering, we're wrapping the central arch to give it a little bit more prominence. Um, let's see here. That's the enlargement of the <coughs> existing 19th hole. The bar is going to be refurbished, but staying in essentially the same place. So if you had a stool there, it'll still be there. Um, on the center portion, um, we're enhancing the locker rooms um, and um, men's and women's locker rooms and the general toilets um, for uh, 19th hole. Um, and that helps us create this entry, um, more of a ceremonial entry on the back side. Um, right hand side, this is the 800 square foot addition to the members lounge. Um, handicap access on this side as well. Currently, that is actually embedded in the terrace, and it kind of blocks your access to the terrace um, because it runs lengthwise across that existing lounge. So some of these efficiencies we have been trying to implement so that it makes better sense, um, and they have a more usable uh, experience at the club. Um, this is... I should, I, pass by a couple of existing elevations. I think you all know what it looks like. Again, you can see um, by this demonstration where the additions are occurring. So this is on the back side. This is that new uh, loggia, and then extending the roof and the uh, windows. Uh, I might mention that the windows uh, actually in the last renovation in 2007 were fabricated by the hotel uh, specifically to match the existing from 1985, I think it was. Um, and we'll be doing that again. 
Um, this is an artist's rendition of what this potentially will look like. I think um, if you didn't know the club, it looks pretty much like what you have today, except it's bigger. Um, I still think the proportions work well, and of course the backdrop of the hotel makes this a very special environment. Um, this is the rear view. Um, I think you can see where we've added some detailed stone, and you can actually see the thickness of the, of the walls now. Um, but again, matching existing architecture. And of course this um, has the outlookers um, underneath the eaves. Those will be repeated, <coughs> same materials. Um, and the terrace actually is being pushed out about 10 feet to add seating, um, additional umbrellas. Um, but again, will feel almost exactly, but bigger than what you have today. Um, that is the rear elevation. Side elevations. This is the cleaned up uh, cart barn area. Um, chimney is going to stay intact as it is today. Um, no substantive changes in the large mass, uh, which actually is the pro shop with the open beam ceiling, will remain. Um, we will um, be protecting that with um, fire protection um, to meet the current codes. Um, so are there any questions that you have for me? Um, I was looking at the number of um, tables you seem to have uh, in addition to what's there now. Yes. And uh, did you enlarge the restaurant? And, yes. and did you get rid of the pro shop? No. So the pro shop remains where it is. The kitchen will be cleaned out predominantly with more efficient equipment. Uh -huh. um, we have food ovens. service on the uh, on the west side or the far side. Yes, yes. Uh, and so we're expanding by 800 square feet the dining inside, as well as probably a thousand square feet on the terrace. I see. Well, looks good. Are you in agreement with the uh, conditions that uh, the staff has? I have read through those and I'm in agreement with those conditions, yes. Okay. I did have one question for the architect, and this is the perfect slide. The extension of the um, 19th hole deck? Yes. Um, I was concerned actually specifically about the wall. Yes. As you walk by, there's currently the transition of the slope of the grass, which right. keeps all, all the, the sections very different from what you're proposing to what it was because you're bringing it out further. Yes. I think it'll be great on the 19th hole. I would encourage um, the applicant to keep that wall green. The one we're looking at now yes. is not just low, but all of it um, because that heavy, you know, sure. a six foot wall versus yeah. uh, would be great. But I, I love the cleanup. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? It was my mother's favorite place to eat was the 19th hole. She loved it. <laughs> there you go. That's uh, great. Any, any questions? Could you um, explain in a little more detail the what you're doing uh, to, with the uh, golf cart area and, uh, sure. and yes. cleaning that up, so to yes. speak? Yes. Um, by expanding the 800 square feet in the 19th hole above, that basically gives us a whole new section of cart barn below because we're going to build two levels. So the lower level will become the cart washing station um, and actually for multiple carts. So they, um, when there is an event, uh, when there's a tournament, um, you have as many as 60 to 80 carts that you have to prep and get out. All that will actually happen inside versus outside. So that's the so there will be an entrance, basically a subterranean or... Yes, there's currently a cart barn. You may not know that, but there's a whole level below the building okay. that, that is behind that berm. It's just very small right now. Okay. Yeah, it's only... No. And, and now that I know that... Now that I know that your mom loved that place to eat, I'll tell you that I was the one that added that deck <laughs> back in 2007. Ask Jean. <laughs> yeah, that was an addition we did to the things uh, back a long time ago. Oh. 
She loved well, it, and and the, yeah. and they would come and get her that, in a golf that cart. Changed, she was that changed that changed that place so much to <laughs> lower the wall. Right. That uh, well, you and, engaged the golf then. And yeah. the only way way we were able to do it, we lowered it and we put that berm flat for a while. Yeah. And then then sloped it down so that it wouldn't be a fall off right situation. So. Yes. I remember that. I'd forgotten you had done less that. than twenty nine inches. Excellent. Right? Yes. <laughs> Any uh, motions? Yes, I'd like to declare Mr. Uh, uh, Historic. Uh. <laughs> I'll move it. Uh, a motion to approve with staff conditions the design proposal for the additions and alterations to the golf <clears throat> operation building of the Billmore Hotel uh, and approve the issuance of special certificate appropriates with the conditions noted above. I'll second. Second. Mr. Fullerton seconds. Mr. Garcia Pong? Yes. Mr. Durana? Yes. Mr. Fullerton? Yes. Mr. Menendez? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Ms. Spain? Yes. Ms. Rolando? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you at the grand opening, <laughs> reopening. I look forward to your invitation. <laughs> as well and we do look forward to seeing you all and building more memories for the next generations to come so thank you thank you thank you okay mr adams any new business old business no i just mentioned earlier that you're um the from the last meeting the garden of our lord historic designation request and the board's decision has been appealed um and i believe it it will be going to yeah. the first meeting in march to the city commission. Okay. I have a couple of items for staff, if I may. Go ahead. Um, back to the roof tiles. I know that we've talked about it a lot. I think at the one of the last meetings, now that Gus is still here, we can keep him on the hook before we transfer the hook over. Um, there was some conversation about putting some language on the application. I forget what the actual final thought was, but that we were going to make it more clear earlier in the process of this um has that been enacted or has not not been done yet it's not been enacted yet um we spe well, we specifically say to applicants you know i specifically say to them i have been here for two years and i n never has this been approved but it does not stop people. But Mr. Adams, I'll interrupt. I, I, you know, one of the things that we really liked about, I think it would end up being your proposal, yep. was that we would put something in writing. Yep. And, and just, it makes a difference when it's in writing than hearing it from staff. Okay. So let's please, and I don't, you know, want to put another date on this, but when we get the next one of these, I'm sure one of us will bring it up again. Um, let's get that, I think it was one simple sentence. Yeah on one application someplace. Yep. That just seemed like a really great way to maybe ease the applicant, the applicant's sort of okay. um, worthiness. And second to the item, um, looking at this application, one of the things we heard today was the roofing companies telling owners not to go with the two-piece parallel tile to as tell is preferable. I think we need to I would like for the city to perhaps provide some sort of notice to the roofing companies just of what you mentioned is letting them know the change perhaps of the language that's going to be in, in whatever piece of paper that is so that they see it or just a, a, a notice to the roofing companies letting them know that this these are the rules uh, and make sure that you know that before you advise your client other another way because they maybe need a reminder um, because yeah. the applicant is in an unfortunate situation where their professional roofing company is advising them contrary to staff. And I think I, I would love, I would feel more secure if the city made an effort to ensure that at least the um, construction companies who have been successfully putting applications in the past couple of years, if we send them a notice uh, in the mail, just reminding them of this so that they can't say that they don't know. Maybe yeah, our, I, our new attorney could tell us how to do that. I, I think we had mentioned it also with the windows on some sort of, even just a hyperlink tutorial, like something that they click on when they apply for the permit. Hey, click on this YouTube video 
to understand a couple of the rules of Coral Gables historic. If your home is historic, X, Y, Z is going to happen, you know, like, so it's very... I've gone from a note to a YouTube video. Yeah, so I, I think, <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> drink a little, just, you know, just an expert or some, something. I'm, I'm sure we could, you know... I'm a big fan of solving all the problems, but I really just want to solve this one. And, and I think just that one sentence on that one sheet of paper would go a long way. So let's, let's maybe get that done, and then we'll move into the YouTube video world. <laughs> just because, you know, I'm, I just love this topic so much. So what would the language, proposed language be? I would refer you back to the meeting where we had this conversation and there was language proposed. Here's the issue. It was a sentence. I understand. But if the sentence reads, S type roof tiles is not approved on historic homes, that is the exact same as if I put it in the city code. That is not what the city wants to do. This is on a per case, per that's item not, issue. So, Mr. City Attorney, that's okay. not what we said. That I, I, I'm, I'm, I, that's once what again, I'm asking is before you put that into the record, at that meeting, mm -hmm. there was a sentence which was not, a, it was not difficult to understand and wasn't, a, wasn't prohibiting s -tiles. It was clarifying some information. And again, I don't remember what it was, but there is a record and it's on there. I don't need to have this conversation again. It was clear then. Okay. I would love for staff to find that record and bring it back at the next meeting so that we could talk about it again. But I don't okay. want to rehash it, as, as, as you don't either. Thank you. Mr. Garcia-Pons, do you recall uh, perhaps when that no, meeting was? No, I went? don't. Okay. But I, I do recall that. Yeah. I have a request. For the, uh, first of all, everyone should walk down the central stairs and notice <laughs> how the city has patched the stairs with white. And so I'm, I would ask you to find out what in the world yeah, I were they thinking, number one. <laughs> and, I noticed it on the way in. And, and find sure out, you noticed it. Find <laughs> out if it's uh, um, reversible? intended to be permanent, yeah. because no, <laughs> yeah. it shouldn't be. Uh, but you should, should bring it to someone's uh, attention, because otherwise they'll think that that's perfectly acceptable. Yep. yep. Mr. Adams, um, about a year ago we talked about uh, at the time that we decided that we would not necessarily need a court reporter all the time, that perhaps we could reuse those funds for a conservator? Uh, this was this was discussed at, um, earlier. Um, we are required to have a court reporter at every meeting. Um, I was informed of that. Oh. <clears throat> so what we're not required to do is necessarily get a transcript for every meeting, but we are required to at least have the meeting recorded. Okay, so that's one half the question. What happened to the conservator? Oh, um, obviously they didn't use one for the stairs. No, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> I did have the opportunity to um, mention it to the assistant city manager, um, and it's not going to happen in this year's budget. But we'll have to try. You know suggest that it may be a possibility for the for the next year's yeah there's a number of of you know issues with city landmarks yeah that that require yeah, yeah. maintenance and and, maintenance. and the suggestion was it would be a conservator that could do both um artworks and you know historic buildings as well and possibly be it, it would mean creating a new position that would be um, but certainly um the opinion I had was it was something that we should we should at least put a request in for. Thank you. And one last question, if I may. I'm going to pick up back when we are with selling the TDRs. Um, so we, we don't continue to run into the same issues that we did previously. Would it be advisable perhaps to create a subcommittee of the, of the board to create an outline of items that should be addressed in each one of the, of the preservation plans? That's up to the chair. I'm sorry? That's up to the chair, not staff. I, I understand, but I'm just asking a question. Just a list of the things that you would want to see addressed in the, in the preservation plan? 
More than what we're doing now. I mean, obviously, we're just getting the, well, these are what needs to be done now. There's no 5, 10, 15 year look. There's no addressing a fire. There's no addressing of what you're going to do with windstorm insurance or other things like that. You know, all of which go to, you know, to making a, shall we say, a solid and long term plan uh, for preservation. One that would be acceptable to say most any other historic preservation organization. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it needs a, a subcommittee, does it? But, it's something that yeah, can but, just you know, be... We've had now, in multiple months, you know, the kind of the same criticisms that we, you know, previously, and I'm just wondering if we're going to be able to solve those and more and codify or at least present an outline that's going to help people put these things together. Yeah, I mean, we can, you know, if you have suggestions as to what you want to see in there, we can start making sure that applicants applicants address that. All I need is a list of things that for the board to successfully review an application for the sale of TBRs, this is what they want to see addressed in the, in, in the plan. I don't think there's a problem with that. Giving an applicant a heads up. If you're going to go to the board and ask for this, then these are the things you have to address. I don't think there's an issue with that. Do we have any TDRs coming up? Not at the moment, no. So now's no. a good time to, um, to work on that. I have received um, a couple of inquiries from property owners who are interested in selling. Um, they have both been sent the application form, but as yet we have not, we have not received any any other applications. So I think word seems to be getting out to the sort of smaller property owners, mm -hmm. which is good, um, but there have been no actual applications made. So, and these are the people that may benefit from the list of what you're looking for because it's possible that they are not going to have attorneys that are experienced in the, you know, have done this a number of times. So I think some of the, the, the the applicants that own smaller properties may very well benefit from from that sort of information. So, Mr. Chair, I think oh, that, that question. If board members have suggestions, ideas, uh, then I would ask them to send them to me, and I can make sure that they get you know, they get put together. And uh, they should probably come straight to me. To, to yeah. Mr. Yeah. Adams, yeah. they don't need to come straight to me rather than than through the chair. I think. Or you can all bring your ideas to the next meeting and we can discuss it and just check off the ones that the board agrees that they, that, that they want to see. Okay. Either way is fine with me. Okay. Oh, then I have one last thing for staff. The uh, Biltmore application, um, the paperwork that we received was I couldn't follow it. It was almost wholly illegible with the comment marks and yeah. the things. I just, if it weren't for the presentation by the architect today, I would not have understood. Because it was too small or because? It, I'll give it to you, but it's got all of these right. comment yeah. marks. I, Everything's it's hard to, blocked out. Yeah. Blacked out. Yeah. So it, if I would have just had the other presentation versus this, I, it would have been much easier to understand. So if staff could at least take, you know, maybe take a look at it or, um, recommend to the applicant. Look, look at this. Clarify. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Any other items? Can you all vote to excuse Alicia? She's she's sick. Mm -hmm. So if you can vote to excuse her. Oh. Um, I'm, I'll move to excuse the absence. Second. Second by Mr. Fullerton. What's his face? Mr. Garcia Pons. Mr. Orlando? Yes. Mr. Garcia Pond? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Ms. Spain? Yes. Mr. Fullerton? Yes. Mr. Durano? Yes. Mr. Menendez? Yes. <clears throat> Motion passes. Okay. And Mr. Fullerton inquired about the benefits for board members and using your board member passes. So I emailed this to all of you while we were sitting there. Okay. Could you please update my address? Thank you. Yeah, I, I just moved, just, just changed the three to a one, one B. I moved downstairs. 
Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, we're adjourned. Oh, every, everybody wish uh, Mr. Durana a happy birthday today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. <laughs>